Thank you. Uh, so it's a real pleasure uh, to be at my alma mater. And thanks to Professor Banerjee and Professor Burnett for hosting this talk. And this talk, uh, as uh, some of you might know, is based on my new book, Designing Urban Transformation. I'm not going to summarize my book. I'm going to, what I'm going to present is about 20% of the book. Obviously, some of it is highlights. And, but I'm going to take one slice of the book. Um, and one of the things I realized when, after I finished writing the book is, this is stuff I've been thinking about ever since I was 16. And I started studying architecture. And where that comes from is whether I was studying architecture, urban design, or city planning, and even other fields I've looked at, like uh, public policy or real estate, uh, I always had a very healthy skepticism towards these fields. On the one hand, I embraced the creativity and sort of uh, visionary attitudes of architects and urban designers, but I always was skeptical of how each of these practices, including planning, makes very singular claims that uh, it's you know really enormously important field, it's very influential, uh, it can do a lot of things, and it was always with a pinch of salt, uh, first of all, to embrace the potential of these fields, but also to recognize their limitations. And so I've been investigating this as a student, uh, as a professor, as a researcher, and also, as you'll see, uh, as a practitioner. So I practice, but I have doubts about my practice, and that's how I keep building and sort of fine-tuning it and hopefully uh, trying to be more effective. So the first part of this journey uh, that I'm going to just talk about today, so this book has about 10 case studies. I'm going to only present uh, three or four of them. Uh, and there are a few of them, so it's a mix of projects that I have done, that are reflected on. And if you read the book, you'll, say, you'll see that I never make the claim that my projects are perfect. I'm always also skeptical of, uh, you know, I go to lectures like you do, and somebody comes and they present this amazing project and everything's perfect. If you've ever lived in the real world, there's no such thing as a perfect project or perfect case study. And you can learn a lot from the ups and downs, the back and forth, et cetera. So this started uh, when I was in my early 20s. I just finished, actually six months before I finished my uh, master's uh, in architecture in Paris. I was recruited to design and start this rural habitat development program in the remote villages of India. And nobody, not my family, not my friends, wanted me to take it. It was sort of very open, very ambiguous. And you know, they were saying, what are you doing? You're going from this amazing, beautiful city to sort of the middle of nowhere. Uh, but like some of you who are that age, this is very exciting, you're very idealistic, and you take it on. And partially I took it on, uh, I was saying this morning, uh, because I didn't know what I was doing. So for the students, sometimes it's all right if you don't know what you're doing. You don't always have to, always have to be an expert in everything. So the mandate was, this was a non-profit foundation based out of Geneva, and they were doing work in India and some other countries in Asia and Africa was to design and build housing for the rural poor to help improve conditions in the villages and help mitigate these, uh, as happens in many parts of Africa, Latin America, Asia, uh, massive migration to the cities where people end up in what are known as slums, which is a word I don't like because I think it's very condescending and derogatory. A lot of people use it, that's fine. I prefer to call them informal settlements where people live in very tough conditions in poverty. So the idea was to improve conditions in the villages to do that. So the first shift came when, of course, I agreed, obviously, to take the job. Uh, I flew back to India, and we started the, uh, the program. I designed it. Was I felt that this mandate that was given to me was not quite on track, that uh, one of the reasons I was selected, I was recruited, was I had done my master's thesis on this topic, where I had lived and researched in the villages. And of course, in my research, I found people knew how to design and build houses. We didn't have to do it. But I also had this sense that there were other priorities. So one of them was infrastructure. So as you see in this image, a uh, problem of clean water, drainage, roads, uh, all kinds of issues. And what was remarkable at that time, especially this is some years ago now, was for a non-profit <coughs> to then allow me time and money to do nothing but research for about nine months. So we lived and worked in the villages, and 
For nine months, we would go out there in our Jeep to places where there was no roads and we crossed rivers, etc., and have lots of conversations, but it wasn't just touchy-feely conversations. We were doing serious, systemic documentation, analysis, research to understand what's going on, what's needed, and we had uh, many dialogues. So one of the things that came out was we made this shift from projects where you know, building housing is a project, building a TOD is a project, uh, building a village is a project, to looking at systems. And one of the systems was to understand how, how villages get built, which was also part of my thesis when I was studying architecture. Uh, part of my skepticism was we would always study very famous architects like Le Corbusier, Frank Lloyd Wright, et cetera, et cetera. But we didn't really have a good understanding, at least in architecture school, how the rest of the world builds their houses, neighborhoods, cities, villages. So from my master's thesis, I, I understood that there were other things going on. So as you see in this slide, one of the things we found was, of course, women play a major role in construction. Here, what they're doing is they're uh, mixing a plaster, which is actually a combination of cow dung, straw, and mud. And they play a major role in construction, repair, etc. But it was to understand how materials came in, how they were transported, uh, etc. We even did research on different kinds of construction materials in terms of durability, waterproof, qualities, and so forth. Another shift that happened, uh, which I think you're beginning to uh, see some connections here, was we were living in, that was a decision I made that, uh, and my team, I was living uh, with them and working in the villages. So there's this phrase that people love to use, which has become a kind of lovely catch-all, but a bit of a lazy phrase called community participation. Like you're doing a favor and people can now participate in your project. Um, and I think there's something problematic about that. Like if you practice, you understand working with communities is extremely tough and extremely complicated. So one of the things we did, and uh, this is again, I'm reflecting on this in hindsight, I was figuring out what we were doing as we went along, was we dissolved this dichotomy between, oh, there's the community, and here we are, the, the people with the knowledge uh, and doing stuff. So there was no community participation. What we would try to do, not always successfully, that we are the community. So you see me here on the right uh, with the beard, and I had some hair at that time, uh, <laughs> dancing with the other guy on the left uh, who is our civil engineer. And we would go for these dances and meals and festivals. And again, it was not this political, strategic, oh, if we pretend we are part of the community, they will believe us, and kind of this manipulative thing. We genuinely wanted to be part of the communities we were living in. So one of the first things that happened uh, Fortunately, was uh, we had these great conversations and dialogues where people would ask us, what are you doing? And uh, to cut a long story short, we would say research, and they were like, what are you doing research on? Because they were used to nonprofits, which were like almost like charities, which would hand out subsidies, which would build schools for them, which would build houses for them. And we would say again and again and again, I remember to this day because I learned the local language, Gujarati. Uh, as you know, India has more languages than Western Europe. Uh, and there are different languages, they're not dialects, they're different grammar, script, and one of them is Gujarati. And so in our conversations, they would always ask, so what are you going to do? How much money are you going to give us and when? And I would say, I have no money, and, but we're around. They're like, what? <laughs> but what happened through those difficult conversations about asking them what are their needs, what are their priorities, we built trust. They showed, oh, these guys are not going away. They're coming back and again and again. And those building of those relationships is much more than community participation. It's building that trust through ups and downs, through disagreements, through you know, uh, debates. The other part of this process was testing our approaches and developing approaches through actual practice. And one of the first ones is what you see here where a group of people came to us and said, we have this kitchen, as you can see, in a really bad shape on the left, and we need to upgrade it. And can you help us? And we said, sure. So being the good architect, at that time I just had my master's in architecture, I drew this beautiful set of drawings I was so proud of. 
because we were living in the middle of the villages, as you can imagine, no computer, no internet, nothing like that. And I showed it to them, and I remember to this day, the masons and carpenters of the village kind of turned it upside down, right side up, and they're like, what the hell is this? <laughs> and I, that's when I realized, and that's very interesting. I mean, it's a, India is still a heavily rural country. Uh, you know, that's always, I find it very amusing when my Indian colleagues and friends come from India and talk about India this and India that. Living and working in the villages was like going to a foreign country. It's a different way of life. And I think a lot of people who live in India and other countries don't really understand how a large majority of their people actually live. So that meant we had to adapt very quickly. And so we, this project, we did it actually on the fly. We started drawing in the dirt, we were talking to them, pointing to the roofs and walls. And uh, we came up with the final product on the right. The other thing we did was, through our research on construction systems and construction materials and supplies, the idea was not to go back to that romanticized mud huts I showed you in the beginning. Uh, even though we like to romanticize mud huts, if you know places like that, mud gets washed away in the monsoons. Every year they have to redo it. That's not fun. They make for great coffee table books and great photographs. So we said, OK, we understand how the construction system works. How do we improve on it? Not go back in time, not kind of produce things where they have to drive 500 miles to buy very expensive materials and very expensive equipment. So you see some of the materials on the right. Uh, we used uh, porcelain tiles, stone, wood, uh, roof tiles. But we introduced things like ventilation, natural light, and so forth. So this idea of not knowing what I was doing, what I mean by that is sometimes uh, your expert knowledge gets in your way. And now, looking back, at that time, I didn't think this way. It was a good thing I did not have a pre-judged, pre-fixed approach. Oh, this is how you do development. What that meant was I, I designed an open-ended, flexible, adaptive approach where we would figure things out, we would do research, we would talk to people, and we would uh, progress in that way versus kind of you know, step one, step two, step three, and so forth. So here, uh, this is me again, again, beard and uh, hair. Uh, and the reason I grew a beard, again, it was, it was just an automatic reaction is in traditional societies like India and many other parts of the world, hierarchy, age, authority matters. And I was very young, I was in my early 20s. Everyone, including the four people who were working with me on my team, were, was much older, 10, 15, 20 years older. And I knew living in these remote villages that the, if I looked my age, they would not really trust me. They would not listen to me and we would have these long, painful discussions of well, I've got a master's from Paris, so I'm not stupid. <laughs> Versus, let's just have a discussion, a collaboration. And so it was very tricky that people would often ask me, how old are you? And I was like, what? Uh, nice weather today, isn't it? <laughs> they were like, what? Uh, so that was a, that was a <coughs> strategy, and that uh, I shaved it the day I left the job. Uh, it was purely for the job, because I knew that's what was needed. So here you see me discussing um, uh, the, another small project we designed, a daycare center. And there was another the thing we saw through this very serious systemic research, um, which again, I hope you're beginning to see parallels with urbanism, because it's a weird way to start a lecture on urbanism, is talk about remote villages, is we also understand what are the assets of a village, what works. Not just fixate on fixing problems, not just obsessed with what's wrong, but look at what's right. So in this case, it was a farmer who had gone off to another city, made a lot of money, and through his generosity, sent a lot of money to this little village and said, design and build a new daycare center. And so we said, we'll do it. And we, of course, we did it pro bono. We were a nonprofit. And you see the little model on the table. And the model was a mode of communication. Unlike standard design, it was not like the final presentation. This is what it looked like. So I'm talking to uh, the daycare center teacher to understand what they were doing. Same construction approach, we use it 
used upgraded materials. Uh, of course, again, being in a remote village, we are very conscious of sun, shade, breeze, uh, microclimates, and so forth. So some of the other things that came out of this flexible, open-ended, adaptive approach is this peer-to-peer -peer training in uh, construction and materials and so forth. So you see the gentleman on the right, he has a beard. Uh, he, uh, it's basically doing sort of collective training each other. So everybody has knowledge. We might introduce some new materials, some new ways of doing things, some prefabricated uh, elements and so forth. Uh, so one of the, the training you see here is uh, in parts of this region where we worked in Gujarat, uh, they are very prone to earthquakes. So the usual response to earthquakes is, you know, the houses crumble, they build them again. So earthquake resistant construction, so we contributed some research, they had some knowledge, this kind of uh, shared learning. Then emergent innovation came out of <laughs> understanding the seasonal fluctuations of this place where one year you have lots of rain during the monsoon season, the next year you have almost no rain. So it goes, fluctuates often from floods to drought. So this idea of rainwater harvesting, uh, rainwater cisterns, either under or next to houses, was kind of a decentralized approach that we adopted amongst others. So I'm just giving you a few examples of that. But finally, the goal was to have long-term impacts. Uh, so how do you do have long-term impacts with short-term projects? And one of the impacts was, you know, again, if you have actually worked with communities, it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of negotiation. You really have a lot of patience and perseverance. And some of these negotiations were painstaking and even painful. And it's okay to disagree. I mean, now the pen pendulum has swung where planners say, oh, yeah, we'll do whatever you want. No, you have some ideas and thoughts, too. You're not just kind of there to serve coffee. And so how do you establish these kinds of partnerships and collaborations? It's a lot of navigation, negotiation, but that's the kind of uh, long-term impact. So there are now village committees, and in all this, we are very conscious of the role of women who tend not to be put uh, in, in front and center. The men tend to dominate. Uh, and so, uh, so we did a couple of those things. So what does this mean for urbanism? Well, there's a step before that. And the step before that is through this practice and other practices that I did at the time and after that, I found that a lot of the theories that we learned in design school, in planning school, did not quite match the reality of practice. One of the reasons, one of the major reasons is practice, like cities, tends to be messy, complicated, and unpredictable. And how do you theorize something which is messy, complicated, and unpredictable? Just think of a city, for example. We try to model it, we try to make it very neat and clean, kind of the engineering approach. But cities are very messy and complicated. There's a lot of different things happening, things go up and down, etc. So uh, I started reading about this philosophy called pragmatism. And the more I read about it, the more it began to fit my experience of practice uh, and urbanism. So let me tell you about pragmatism. Pragmatism is probably the only uniquely American school of philosophy. Most philosophy that we, we tend to study in universities and colleges is European philosophy. And so pragmatism got its start in the late 1800s. Uh, partially it was a reaction to European philosophy and I'll explain uh, how and why. But it was also at the time that the empirical sciences, biology, chemistry, physics in the, in the 19th century were, were coming up. So this notion of empirical evidence, testing ideas not just through logic and wordplay but through actual lived experience. So that was also very unique about this American philosophy. It was to make philosophy more accessible and kind of philosophy that actually makes a difference in people's lives. So three uh, principles I'm just going to highlight which I found connected to my work in the rural program. This is again I, afterwards, it wasn't like, oh, I'm doing pragmatism. It was like, oh, I begin to see the connection. 
So one is experimentation. And experimentation isn't just experiment for the sake of experiment. What they say is that you test ideas through real life. You test philosophical ideas, abstract ideas, conceptual ideas through actually trying them out in real life through projects, etc. But you don't just test them to say yes or no, you then evaluate and kind of modify those ideas and concepts kind of in a, in a feedback loop in a serious and systematic way. And I, I found that that's kind of what we were trying to do in the rule program. Again, it was not, it was a flexible open-ended approach, but it wasn't just like anything goes. We were trying things out and you know, like when I realized they can't read my beautiful drawings, damn, I better not make any more drawings uh, or find other ways of working, right? So it was again changing our approaches. The second principle that I found had sort of some commonality with the rule program was anti-foundationalism. And this is basically arguing against the platonic ideal, like Plato's philosophy that there are certain truths and maxims and it's always like that. Uh, and basically it's saying, I mean the parallel I draw with like urban planning and this is like the canonical approach that, oh, uh, how can you be an urban planner if you have not read Jane Jacobs? Uh, you can, uh, but it's like in every field, architecture, urban design, public policy, oh, you must read this canon, you must do this. And what they say, no, ideas actually emerge and evolve out of particular circumstances. These are not hard and fast rules for always. So there is not a foundational premise, but you kind of, ideas emerge out of context, and then ideas evolve and adapt. And what they say is that the ideas which last are the ideas that can adapt, not the ideas that are ultimate truths. And that ties into experimentation. These ideas are tested and evolve over time and so forth. And the last one is the social character of knowledge, that knowledge is produced socially. And the best example I can think of is even, you know, this in our society, uh, whether it's any field, in academia, in the practice, there's always like, role models and superstars. So one of the biggest superstars was Isaac Newton, who discovered the laws of gravity, amongst many other things. He's famous for that, but actually, uh, you know, he's widely considered a genius. Even he said, if I have seen further, it is because I have stood on the shoulders of giants. So he was building on the knowledge of others. However much we like to romanticize such and such genius who came up with an idea, it's always directly or indirectly building on knowledge that's been produced before by others, uh, through teams, through uh, indirect knowledge. So what we were doing in the rural program was we were constructing the social character of knowledge by coming to these negotiated agreements, which again I said was sometimes very painful. They were really disagreements. What are we going to do? What's the project? What's everybody's role? But these kind of negotiated shared understanding of what is and what should be. So then I shifted to researching this further, what kinds of other insights in terms of urban transformation can pragmatism offer? I mean, apart from pragmatism, the other parallel between the rural program and urbanism is this notion of flexible, open-ended approaches. It's not community part participation, but kind of a very serious community engagement that takes a long time. Uh, it was this, these notions I mentioned, experimentation, anti-foundationalism, social character of knowledge, which are not just for remote villages in India, but it applies to definitely to urban projects. So taking this further, I analyzed several case studies, as I mentioned, there are about 10 of them in the book. Here I'll mention three of those. And I wanted to look at case studies from all over the world. So it's not just about, you know, one country or one place, but how do these ideas and concepts play out in different contexts? So Cairo, Boston, Karachi. So the first inspiration I drew from pragmatism, so you'll see when I was looking at pragmatism, it wasn't taking pragmatism literally and saying, oh, so what answer does it give me? No, when you look at theory, philosophy, you have to interpret and apply it. Uh, philosophers don't tell you, oh, do this in the city. I mean, that's, in fact, philosophers, the really good philosophers almost never say that. 
So the first idea which was inspired by pragmatism is beyond objects city as flux. So this is one of the pragmatist philosophers, William James. Uh, what really exists is not things made, but things in the making. Once made, they are dead, and an infinite number of alternative conceptual decompositions can be used in defining them. But put yourself in the making by a stroke of intuitive sympathy with the thing and the whole range of possible decompositions coming at once into your possession, you are no longer troubled with the question of which of them is absolutely true. Reality falls in passing into conceptual analysis. It mounts in living its own undivided life. It budges and burgeons, changes and creates. So what does this imply for urbanism and practice? It implies two things. First of all, we tend to understand uh, and practice in cities as if cities are mostly three-dimensional objects. We have a master plan, we design and build a neighborhood, a campus, a building, infrastructure, uh, and so forth. So it's usually, usually the goal is some end product, a transit system, something. But what he says is the city is always changing. And again, it's easy to say, it's very easy to say city has flux, but how do we practice that? How do we design that? Do we still keep doing drawings and models and reports with finite endpoints? How do we grapple with that? But the second uh, inspiration from uh, this, this book by William James is our understanding of cities is also changing. As we do more research, as we gain more knowledge, as we experience different cities, hopefully our understanding of cities is also in flux. <laughs> So if the cities are in flux and our understanding is in flux, how do we get a handle on that? So I looked at several case studies to test these ideas and I'm going to present one of them just to give you a flavor. So this is one from Cairo. This is the Al-Azhar Park. Uh, it was started in 1984 to the present. One of the things you'll see that all the case studies that I've analyzed in the book and the presentation all were done several years ago because I think it's a misnomer to judge success or failure when nothing has been done. And, there, uh, and I'll come back to this point where all kinds of awards are given for all kinds of plans and projects where nothing has happened. And they're kind of giving, saying it's hypothetically successful, which is ridiculous. So, uh, so what's interesting in all these case studies when you're judging transformation, you have to look at the context. That's why I looked at different contexts. It can't be one size fits all. So this context is, as you can tell, it's a very dense area of Cairo. This neighborhood is called Darb al Amar. Uh, this is actually under construction here. But what makes it even more complicated that it's a very dense, historic, low-income neighborhood of Cairo. But the site which is under construction here was actually a garbage dump for 500 years, a 500 year old garbage dump, you know, only in Egypt, uh, where everything is measured in centuries. You know, it's such an ancient civilization. So uh, it's a very tough site. And the beginning of the project was very interesting. It was a philanthropist, the Aga Khan. There was a conference in 1984. And through the conference, they were discussing open space, public space, parks in Cairo. And there are very few parks. There are very few green spaces in Cairo. He said, I will donate $30 million to give a gift to the people of Cairo, this beautiful new park. And what was even more remarkable, they decided to make this in one of the poorest areas of Cairo, which is very rare. Like imagine one of the poorest areas of Los Angeles and somebody gives $30 million to design a magnificent new park. I don't think it's, I don't think it's happened. So this is what it looks like now. So you still see the very dense historic neighborhood all around it. Uh, and you see this kind of green oasis in the middle. And you see the park is, has a number of elements to it. It has a small lake. It has alleys you can walk around. It has more informal parts at the edges, more formal, which are inspired by traditional Islamic gardens. Uh, and it has all kinds of magnificent views, which I'll show you. So the first remarkable thing about this as a city as flux was just the design process. So the, initially, remember, this was a park designed by landscape architects. 
called Sites International from Cairo, husband and wife team, wonderful people. I had invited them to New York to give a talk. They gave an amazing talk. Uh, if you look at them, they're not these flashy designers. They're kind of this fuddy-duddy husband-wife team who are brilliant, beautiful, simple. And you can see how super smart they are without trying to prove they're super smart. Uh, and you understand. So they were talking about, they had two problems. First of all, as they did soil testing, the soil was much worse than they thought. And so they had to kind of clean up the soil and you know, fix that. But then it became worse. The city of Cairo, the municipal government, decided to build three huge concrete water tanks right in the middle of the design process. Because this was one of the only op uh, pieces of open land left. So they had to redesign it again. So even the design process was in flux. And you see uh, some of the outcomes, the fountains, and uh, some of the patterns inspired by traditional Islamic architecture. Then another thing happened in this process of flux. While they were cleaning up the site, you know, I remember this was a huge garbage dump uh, of 500 years, they discovered this old historic wall, the Ayubid wall, which was about 1,000 years old, about a mile and a half long, and they said, what to do? And this became one of the major historic discoveries in Egypt at the time. They decided to do historic preservation. But it gets better. They decided to do historic preservation by training people in this low-income neighborhood to do historic preservation. So, so a park became a historic preservation program, became a job training program. And it's a great job to have in a country like Egypt, which has so many historic monuments, you're set for life. You're doing constant historic preservation, rehabilitation, etc. But it gets even better. So as they were training people and dealing with the neighborhood, people would come to them and talk to them about the condition of the neighborhood, and they realized that another major problem was housing. Uh, old housing stock, which was crumbling, people didn't have money for it. So they started a microfinance program for helping people rehab their houses but also to start small businesses. Again, remember, this is a very poor neighborhood. And also a health program, right? So, so what's interesting about this is what was a conventionally yet beautifully designed park became historic preservation, became job training, became housing, became microfinance, became a health program. And it's still going on. So the park itself opened in 2005, and you think, oh, great. And the park has been on magazine covers, and everybody loves it. But I think the real remarkable aspect is the city as flux. It's still going on. And the other interesting thing this begins to challenge is this you know, conventional dichotomy that we talk about a lot, top-down versus bottom-up. So this started as a top-down project where this rich uh, multimillionaire philanthropist gave money, a gift to the city of Cairo. But now it's become this partnership with communities, with local government, with international foundation, and so forth, and it's still evolving. OK, so the second conceptual shift that came out of this uh, research on theorizing practice was beyond intentions, consequences of design. So this is a quote from Charles Peirce. Such reasoning and all reasonings turn upon the idea that if one exerts certain kinds of volition, one will undergo in return certain compulsory perceptions. What he's saying is you have to make an effort on how you perceive things. Now this sort of consideration, namely that certain lines of conduct will entail certain kinds of inevitable experiences is what is called a practical consideration. Hence it's justified the maximum belief in which constitutes pragmatism. Namely, in order to ascertain the meaning of an intellectual conception, one should consider what practical consequences might conceivably result by necessity from the truth of that conception. And the sum of those consequences will constitute the entire meaning of the conception. So he's saying, uh, again, in, to put it in context of cities and urbanism, two things. First of all, we have all kinds of concepts and theories and ideas in, in urbanism which are based on intentions. My favorite example is sustainability. We say something is sustainable because somebody says it's sustainable. And I can point to 
award program after award program, magazine cover after magazine cover, it says this project is sustainable, that project is sustainable. I argue they have no idea what they're talking about. We don't know something sustainable until 10, 20 years later, until we study the consequences. Just because an, a planner, politician, designer says sustainable, we go, oh yeah, yeah, it's sustainable. We don't really know. So what he's saying is the shift. Yes, of course intentions are important, but look at consequences much more seriously. But even he goes even deeper, he says the very concept itself has consequences. So one example is just the concept of city. It's amazing how many people I know who are urbanists, planners, urban designers, urban policy makers are actually anti-urban. And they don't even kind of maybe explicitly realize that. What I be, mean by anti-urban, they see the city as a place of problems, and mostly as a place, place of problems. They don't appreciate fully maybe that cities are also probably one of uh, humankind's most fantastic creations. There are all kinds of wonderful things, innovations, uh, conglomerations, all kinds of amazing things happen when people get together. Uh, but so even the concept of city has consequences. If you approach a city as mostly problematic, that's how you will practice. But if you begin to city, see the city in much more complex and multifaceted way, and look at also assets and what's going right, and underappreciated things, you would approach it in a different way. You would practice in a different way. So concepts have consequences. So I theorized this practice by looking at this famous project that some of you know in Boston. Uh, the official name is Central Artery and Tunnel Project. It's mostly known as the Big Dig, started in 1991 by the Massachusetts Turnpike Authority. And here again, like the previous one, even though officially it was completed in 2007, I say it's still not done, and you'll understand why. So the origins of this one is this elevated highway in the 50s where like a lot of American cities, they build these big, gigantic, ugly highways through the middle of the city. In Boston, they built the elevated highway uh, known as the Central Artery. And you can see from this picture, and you can imagine how it divided neighborhoods. Very few years after it was built, it led to traffic congestion, increasing pollution, uh, fragmentation, and so forth. And this is what it looks like now, uh, the Rose Kennedy Greenway. And so the, the idea was to bury the traffic underground, to free up open space, to visually and physically reconnect the city. Uh, the problem is there are multiple narratives about this project. The most common one is the narrative of failure. Because this project was supposed to take a few years, it took 15 years. So you can imagine this massive, Construction going on 15 years, it led to lots of you know, detours and problems of people living and working there. It cost way more, it was going to cost 2.3 million, it cost 14.6, no, 2.3 billion, it cost 14.6 billion. Uh, it, there was some very poor construction quality, there was a concrete panel which fell and killed a woman who was driving in a car, there were lawsuits and so forth. So the narrative is it's a failure. Now, of course, the official narrative of the Massachusetts Turnpike Authority is it's a success. And it has been shown empirically through studies that it has reduced pollution because cars that are moving pollute less than cars that are idle. It has reduced commute times. It has improved connections like to the airport and to the suburbs. And it has freed up open space. It has increased property value, so uh, property owners are earning uh, more money, there's more tax revenue, and so forth. But I take a third narrative. Uh, that, so the question is, is it worth it? You know, the cost-benefit analysis question. Was it worth it? Was it worth all these years, all this construction, all this money, which was way over budget and bloated? So I say, yes, that is an important question. But there's another question of consequences, which is not only was it worth it, but also how can we now make it worthwhile, which is designing for future consequences. So this is an image of the construction. It gives you a feel for the size and scale, and it's very complicated. That's the other thing. Uh, in a historic city like bon uh, Boston, 
any massive infrastructure construction is very complicated. And they did some very interesting stuff. This is what it looks like, which is a series of tunnels. For example, it created new connections to the airport, which is the blue line you see on the right. Uh, the upper left is a new bridge across the Charles River. So it connected, at least for people in cars, uh, it improved commuting time, it connected different neighborhoods and so forth. So what are some of the consequences? So one consequence I look at is what I call symbolic consequences that we sometimes forget. So one is this new bridge, the Zakim Bridge, that crosses the Charles River, which has now kind of become the symbol of Boston. How do we know? Like if you look at, I love to look at local TV. If you want to know local culture, local TV is a nice place to start. And very often, whenever they interview somebody in Boston, they're sitting in front of a green screen where they project this bridge in the background, right? So I mean, I don't know, what is the symbol of LA? Downtown in the mountains? I don't know. Surfer? What? Three ways, yeah. <laughs> so you know, uh, but you know what I mean, like Paris, it's Eiffel Tower, uh, London, it's Big Ben. So this has become kind of a symbol of 21st century Boston. But what's interesting, what a lot of people have said, it's this project is also a symbol of reverse engineering. Not reverse engineering in the, in the typical sense, but fixing one's mistakes, which is building this highway in the middle and kind of, you know, this elevated highway which caused this fragmentation, pollution, uh, and that's interesting. That's a very interesting thought. We can go back and fix our mistakes or try to fix them. Um, but the other part of the consequences was unexpected happy surprises, unexpected consequences. So this is Spectacle Island, which was a kind of a dump, a landfill in the middle of Boston Harbor. And they were excavating this land to build all these tunnels underground in downtown Boston. And they said, where should we dump this? This is not part of the original plan. We, there's a lot of soil we're excavating. How about here? How about we make it a park? So now thousands of people go and have a good time on Spectacle Island, what used to be just a dump. Another ex unexpected consequence was this house, the Big Dig house, where one of the contractors who was working on the Big Dig, they were just going to throw away the old highway, the, you know, the uh, metal beams and columns. And he said, can I have it to build a house? They said, yeah, we just, this is just junk. So he got those for free. It was built for very cheap. Of course, he was a contractor, so he could get things you know, very cheaply or for free. And so this is interesting. How do you recycle old infrastructure into new things, new houses, new neighborhoods, maybe even new infrastructure? But going beyond that, and this is sort of my point of uh, how do you now make it worthwhile, is designing for future consequences. So if you view this project as done, it's finished in 2007, that's done, there's nothing you can do. But if you say, you know, it's, it's going on, you can still design future consequences. So one of my former colleagues at MIT, uh, Mei Jin Yun, who's an architect, came up with this fascinating hypothetical project which she calls uh, public works, unsolicited small projects for the Big Dig. And she came up with these proposals to enhance the Big Dig even more. And these are kind of hypothetical, they're very imaginative, but I think there's a lot of power in them. So in the upper left, you see this tri-panel ground where she would have these three-sided panels which you could change. Uh, as you can kind of see in the image, it becomes parks, or it could become a road, or it could become football fields. On the upper right, there are all these ventilation towers for all these tunnels that go through downtown and underwater. Those could become vertical gardens. You can plant uh, plants on them. And then unfill is basically saying between the tunnels, which go on deep underground, and the surface, there's this land that can be used for like parking or something. You're doing that construction anyway. You're digging up that land. So it's kind of more efficient use of land. So it's sort of an interesting thought that you can keep working on it and come up with imaginative ideas that were never thought of in the original project. Okay, so the third uh, conceptual shift is beyond practice urbanism as creative political act. So this is a little more complex, so I'll explain it to you. So this is a quote from another pragmatist philosopher, Richard Rorty, and he says, moral choice becomes always a matter of compromise. So here, and I'll explain what I mean by politics, I say moral choice is a political act. 
between competing goods rather than a choice between absolutely right and wrong. We stake our sense of who we are on the outcome of such choices. For pragmatists, moral struggle is continuous with the struggle of existence. So what this implies is we make moral choices all the time, especially when you're dealing with cities. It's never just a job. It's never just a project. It's never just do this or that. It's, it's a moral choice. And no sharp break divides the unjust from the imprudent, the evil from the inexpedient. What matters for pragmatists is devising ways of diminishing human suffering and increasing human equality, increasing the ability of all human children to start life with an equal chance of happiness. So there are three implications for urbanism. One is to uh, realize that when we make choices about what to do, what not to do, what's the best way to do it, it has always a moral dimension to it. And it's not just right or wrong. What he's saying is kind of a gray area. There are multiple choices and you kind of, it's a struggle. The second implication is when I say create a political act, it's not just politics with the big P. It's not just, oh, politics, so that's the mayor and city council. It's the everyday politics of working as a team, of dealing with the community, of the project, that it's not just neat and clean kind of a linear process. It's very poli the politics of the everyday of the city. And the third implication is for pragmatists, progress is not material progress. It's not even quality of life progress. It's moral progress. And they kind of define it there, that progress in society is ultimately moral. So this uh, has to do with ethics. So to test this theory, uh, one of the case studies I looked at was in Karachi, Pakistan. Uh, this Orangi pilot project was started in 1980 by a nonprofit called the Orangi Pilot Project Research and Training Institute. So Orangi is an informal settlement, one of the poorest areas in Karachi in one of the poorest countries in the world, Pakistan. So I think when you talk about things like transformation, innovation, all these cool words, you have to look at the context. What are you up against? This is probably one of the toughest places in the world to do anything. So it's, this is probably one of the most remarkable case studies I've ever come across. So here you see the conditions where there is, like in many informal settlements in Asia, Africa, Latin America, where the vast majority of people live. Uh, People live in these conditions where there's sewage, raw sewage, waste, garbage, dump running through the streets. Because there's no sanitation, there's no sewage. People are kind of just struggling, surviving on their own. So what the Orangi Pilot Project did was kind of a low-cost, community-based sewage system. And it's very simple. And this is what the streets look like afterwards. So this is not one of those projects that gets on magazine covers, that wins awards, that's sexy, and everybody points to, oh yeah, look at that green roof, look at this. But this has a far greater impact than most of them. This has benefited about a million people in one of the most poverty-stricken parts of the world. It's one of the toughest places to work. So it's very remarkable. So how do they do it? So it started with this nonprofit called the Orangi Pilot Project Research Institute, Research and Training Institute, and they were called in uh, by people in, uh, in this uh, informal settlement with these problems of sewage, as you know, leads to serious health problems, hygiene, sickness, and so forth. So they didn't really have an answer, and what they said to people, we will work with you we would like you to organize and we'll work on this lane by lane basis. So each, each of these small lanes, and I'll show you a large map in a little while. And the people said, well, we don't have anything. We are not organized. We don't have an organization. We don't have any money. We don't have any skills. And they said, no, uh, as a nonprofit, we don't have anything either. We'll have to figure it out together. And they said, well, we can't do it. And so the nonprofit said, well, and this is not typical community participation. They said, well, let us know when you're ready to work with us. And they walked away. So it's not this touchy-feely, oh, tell us what you want. I'm, hey, we'll hold your hand. You know, it's kind of a, I don't know what to call it, maybe a tough love approach of partnership. So they came back. And the first thing they did was you have to organize yourselves. We are not going to deal with every house separately. So 
So as a lane, you have to get together. You have to have an organization leader who will coordinate. And we will supply the knowledge, and we'll figure out how to pay for it. But you will have to help pay for it. So they did this lane by lane. And uh, for the first time in their lives, this very technical, low-key approach helped get the community organized and mobilized. So when people see this slide, they think, oh, community participation. Of course, I'm not talking about community participation. Uh, and to illustrate what this slide is, says is, so I invited one of the people who has been working on this uh, to come to New York and give a talk at our university. And he was this kind of short, white-haired man, very low-key, very soft-spoken, brilliant, kind of trained as an architect engineer. And he gave this talk, and we had a mic, and we couldn't hear him. He was so soft-spoken. We kept asking him to speak up. And it's, it's so bad that even we have a video of him, we can't hear the sound. <laughs> and then he had this incredibly dull and boring slideshow. Like you, variations of this. Here's a pe group of people meeting. Here's another group of people meeting. Here's a fifth group of people meeting. I'm just like, what's going on? This is brilliant project. And this incredibly dull, boring, technical, like he would also show slide after slide of, here's a drainage pipe. Here's another drainage pipe. And then I, it hit me, that was their creative political act. In this incredibly violent, poor uh, part of the city, which is rife with all kinds of tensions, gender discrimination, you name it, their approach was not shouting from the rooftops, but their approach was, we are going to work on this problem that everyone faces of sewage and sanitation. We are going to use this technical, low-key, straightforward way to organize and mobilize the community. <coughs> and over time, and again, there was no master plan. It was like, again, as they went along, they figured it out. So now, this is the remarkable plan. Each little arrow, that each little red arrow is a lane. So over 30 years now, a million people now have sanitation and sewage where there was none. But there's more. So in, in this creative political act of being a technical partner and facilitator, not a mover and shaker, they began to organize people around women's entrepreneurship, again, in this area where there's a lot of gender discrimination, uh, health clinics, uh, and so forth. So empowering women to have at least some semblance of control over their lives and over their future in what is you know, uh, not a very women-friendly environment. You know, how do you do that? So this has now benefited a million people. So uh, to wrap up, what does this have to do with transforming cities? And I looked at this word transformation, which is one of those feel-good words like sustainability, resilience, green design. Anything else? Am I missing something? What? Community participation, democracy, it's all very nice. And so I wanted to understand what is transformation. Transformation is not change, it's different things. So common ways of understanding transformation tend to be physical. The growth of a city in terms of size and population, you know, uh, physical change, old building, new building. But I mean something else. I mean deeper structural change. And in my book, I'm looking at what I mean is transformation can be negative. But I mean, how can urbanism lead to positive transformation? And through my research and practice and teaching, I came to the conclusion the way to transform cities is to transform the field of urbanism itself. How we conceive of and practice urbanism as a field. So what does that mean? Well, urbanism has all kinds of definitions. So I'm just going to highlight a few briefly. So urbanism you know, is sometimes is the same thing as urban design uh, for, um, in the conventional sense. So urban design is sometimes seen as a bridge between architecture and planning and maybe landscape architecture and sometimes civil engineering. Another conventional definition is sort of the in-between spaces, urban design, urbanism deals with the public realm, public spaces, open spaces, streets. It's often a uh, very popular approach now is best practices. Look at best practices happening all over the world, give awards. 
and this, uh, this image is list, that's a new trend. So it says there's 60 different kinds of urbanisms and there's people getting very excited, it's like a sport. I discovered two more. <laughs> so there's like informal urbanism, new urbanism, infrastructural urbanism, suburbanism, green urbanism. Imagine 60, like you can read this article, it's by Jonathan Barnett in Planning Magazine. It's about uh, three years old. And then I got this email, oh, slow urbanism is like slow food. I'm like cool, let's go on. Uh, the problem with that approach is, of course, it just leads to more fragmentation, more specialization. So for every problem, infrastructure, oh, I'm going to do infrastructure urbanism. Informal settlements, oh, informal urbanism. Oh, suburb, suburbanism. Uh, oh, problems of ecology, ecological urbanism, landscape urbanism. So in my research, teaching, and practice, I came to a different conclusion that the way to transform the field of urbanism is through theory. And I come from practice. So people wonder, like, what the hell are you talking about? This is so impractical. It's just ideas and words and this kind of airy-fairy academic stuff, which I love, by the way. Uh, so why theory? A couple of things. The first thing is I believe in, from my experience that the most powerful thing we have to transform cities is not money, it's not GIS and software, it's our brain. This, our head, how we think, how we analyze, how we propose, our creative thinking, that is our most powerful weapon and we all have that. What that means is it's not only about how you think about cities, but how we think about thinking about cities. It's called metacognition. So it's to understand that like right now, it's very fashionable to think about the smart city, the sustainable city, the green city, the resilient city. I don't know what's big in LA. The transit city, the linear city, right? So and the point is, uh, on a more serious note, you kind of consider, okay, so what are the pluses and minuses of you think of the smart city, the network city, the high-tech city? What does it leave out? Issues of control, power, excess. The sustainable city, which I think is a very low standard. Sustainability basically says do no harm. I think we should go back and fix things. We should radically improve things, not have such low standards. Um, and so on and so forth. You can think about how we think about cities, look at pluses and minuses, and really theorize and use our brains and uh, because I don't see thinking and acting as two separate acts. So these, what do these conceptual shifts mean in terms of transforming cities and transforming the field? So beyond objects means yes, of course we see around us the city as a set of buildings, open spaces, infrastructure, but I think the power lies in practicing city as flux. Uh, and I have some other examples in the book where I talk about how you can do that, but how do we get that around in our heads that it's always changing. It's always changing and how do you, how do you intervene with that? How do you design for flux? And it's not designing, doing drawings, models, plans, reports. It's something different. Maybe it's a little bit, maybe not. So that Second conceptual shift beyond intentions, consequent design. Of course, intentions are important, but it's paying more attention to consequences. Sort of one of my favorite questions, which is the so what question. So let's say your project was rated lead platinum. So what? What does that mean for the city? Are you saving water? Are you like uh, uh, one of the books I'm writing now is in Las Vegas, and it is Las Vegas now has the largest most highly rated private development in the world in terms of lead. It's lead platinum, lead gold. So it's very sustainable. One minor problem, it's built in the middle of the desert. <coughs> what are the consequences of that? You want to be sustainable, don't build in the middle of the desert. And the third one is beyond practice. By that I mean is not just a professional practice, not just a government practice, not just a non-profit practice but to engage, to understand, engage, and work through what I call small, uh, politics with a small p, the politics of moral choice, moral progress, of working with others, and so forth. And using our creativity not just to design things, but design processes. So finally, I started with the question, what can urbanism be? The typical question is, what is? 
what is city planning, what is architecture, what is landscape architecture, what is urban design? I think that's the wrong question to ask. Sometimes we are so desperate for answers, we love people who come and tell us this is how you should do things, you know, this is a smart city, this is a sustainable city, and we go and do it. We don't realize we are asking the wrong question. So the what is question focuses on the status quo. It focuses on the present. It does not focus on the future. It sort of implicitly accept, oh, this is the way it is, okay. This is planning, okay. This is urban design. The other problem with the what is question is we settle for very narrow, professionally defined definitions. Very narrow definitions. So what I'm suggesting is the most powerful thing we can do is to ask powerful questions. What can urbanism be is future oriented. You can make it anything you want, of course based on reality. You can investigate, you can test, you can really come up with amazing ideas. Uh, and it, it's more problematic because there's no clear answer. But all these definitions of what is a city, what is an urbanism, if you think about it for a few minutes, are invented. Everything is invented. Nothing is, we can respect tradition, we can respect history, but it's not sacred. What that means is we can reinvent urbanism and we can transform cities. Thank you. Um, the whole idea of really the designer not necessarily being the black box where things are coming into one's mind and something magically appears, be it a plan, be it a project, be it um, a, a building, that we really need to look into the context, you mentioned context, and I, I very much agree, to look into the situation um, to be, I would call, um, much more user-oriented than self-oriented, and that's something that I think planners and urban designers should do even more than, than architects. Architects have a client, oftentimes you can have a, a direct relationship with a client, but oftentimes they are much more of a black box than a glass box of design. Uh, so you, you, you didn't mention, uh, but, but implicitly I think, uh, what you said implies that we have to be much more user-oriented uh, and also look into what a, a Japanese scholar back in the 1960s um, distinguished between the substantial clients and the nominal clients of design. And I think designers um, really have to look into some of the substantive clients who are all the people that are going to use the, the space, who are going to live in the space, who are going to work to play in the space, versus the nominal clients who are the people who are paying the commission, uh, the private sector, public sector, nonprofits that may be paying you as they did in the early project you, you showed, but you very much worked with the substantive clients who were the people in the community that in many ways were the real experts and they kind of taught you how they live, how they play, how, how they work. And I think every um, urban designer and planner should get clues from the real experts. Um, another aspect that I think I very much agree is this design and planning being guided by cultural determinants. And I think pra pragmatism comes in um, here, uh, and especially the idea of prag pragmatism, that there is no absolute truth, that there are different truths. And if you uh, take this uh, and project it into communities, there are no universal, I mean, yes, we have universal needs in terms of we all uh, need to, to be fed and we all need to be uh, comfortable in terms of weather and shelter and all that, but beyond that, different social contexts, different cultures, uh, different ages, different ethnicities have different needs. And these should be reflected in urban design and oftentimes is not. Uh, and I think that's, that's another thing I, I got out of, of uh, your talk. 
you also talked a lot about um, how should we do, um, how should we interact with, with communities. Uh, you talked about engagement and not necessarily community participation. What I get from that is the idea of really privileging the communities to become the real experts, uh, doing something that John McKnight calls asset mapping in the community where you really look into what are the strengths of, of this community and allowing the community to convey these, these strengths and then you, around these strengths, you build your plans and your designs that are for, for uh, the community. In terms of the city as, as a flux, I think um, definitely, especially in the early 20th century, uh, cities are very dynamic, transforming places and when we go with some very specific, concrete, rigid ideas, chances are we're, there is going to be failure and there needs to also always be a plan B in terms of if this is not going to work, okay, let's uh, retool and let's, um, let's think of, of, something, of something else. Um, and lastly, um, I want to talk a bit about the... Um, the, the, di the different, the multiple narratives and what is a good outcome and what is a not good outcome. Uh, yes, there is this whole literature on mega projects and uh, a lot of that finds a lot of these projects as, as failures. And a lot of them are. Uh, but quite often it is not only kind of a very um, narrow cost-benefit analysis that is important. I mean, how many cents and dollars this translates to. And I, I'm saying this also with another controversial project that is happening here uh, in California. That's the high-speed rail project. Uh, and, and in my view, the projects are more, if, if the project is a single-minded project, if a project is only going to serve one purpose, like t taking people from point A to point B, this is problematic. And we have to start looking into the consequences, the other effects, how do we create from something that is, let's say, a major infrastructure as the big dig was, or as the high-speed rail is going to be, something that is much larger than that, than trans transporting people from the uh, Logan Airport to downtown, or transporting people from Los Angeles to San Francisco. How do you cut, do you use this project to become more of a, a catalytic project in, in California. What do you design around these neighborhoods? How do you take advantage of existing assets that some of the cities have? Uh, Disneyland in, in Anaheim, for example. And using these major new infrastructure to promote economic development, to build uh, more jobs, to create more parks and open spaces. And I'm not very optimistic that this is happening in California right now where all the emphasis and all the debate is about the dollars and the cents. Yes, this needs to happen. And even um, the, the different uh, public agencies and organizations are really focusing more on a single-minded project, which is transporting people from point A to point B. And I think what you were showing in uh, the Big Dig is all the other wonderful things that happened. But for th these things to happen, we need to design and plan for. And I will leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, so Asim, I'd like to thank you again for this uh, you know, engaging presentation. I, I greatly enjoyed it, as I did uh, you know, looking through your book. Um, I think we truly do need to think more boldly about the practice of urban design and, and urbanism as, as a whole and um, kind of think about the breadth of its horizons and, and the values it represents and that it could potentially realize. Um, I, I really like the, the accent on, on practice, uh, perhaps in maybe this and, and other fields, uh, pointing to concrete practical ways to bridging the gap uh, between uh, practice and, uh, and theory is a pivotal undertaking. Um, <coughs> um, you know, you, you argue, and, and I think this is in the book, that it's kind of, I'm quoting here, no longer viable to tweak at the edges um, of a narrow conception of the field. And I totally agree with, uh, with that sentiment. Um, indeed, uh, theoretical frameworks have often treated uh, place as an abstract concept, and we need to kind of move away from that. Uh, space is obviously much more. It, it kind of uh, it constitutes um, um, society um, in terms of uh, you know, economics all the way to aesthetics. It's a much broader, uh, much broader concept. 
um, you know, in, invoking uh, pragmatism, you thus kind of call us to think a little bit more holistically about urban design, urbanism. Um, I, I guess in the spirit of this call, I would say that maybe, um, you know, I don't think there's maybe necessarily anything deficient about the sort of uh, architectural definition of, of urbanism uh, that you're criticizing. It's maybe just probably not the only one that we need to have. It's one of many. Um, Peirce, for example, you know, the famed uh, pragmatist philosopher was very much against um, any, any kind of reductionist interpretation. I'm going to maybe uh, quote something from Peirce here where he says that, you know, in considering kind of the impacts of ideas, he says that we need to consider what effects uh, they might conceivably have and we can conceive uh, the object of our conception to have and the, the, the effects and the conception is the whole kind of the entire set of effects rather than just uh, kind of the theory to, that we start with. So, um, so yes, we do need to think holistically about, um, about urbanism. Um, I, I want to say a few words about this, uh, this question of relativism. Um, now, of course, you know, every, every idea does have consequences. You know, that's kind of the way I think of it. Um, and and the, the question, I guess, in my mind is, uh, well, what are the practical consequences that are really worthwhile having? Um, I know that you know, we, we talked a little bit about uh, the fact that there is some kind of measure of unpredictability in, in a lot of the projects that we do. Um, but the, then the question kind of becomes, you know, um, and this is maybe something that comes out of the pragmatist you know, field of, of thought as well, um, how is it that we kind of save ourselves from kind of uh, falling back into a kind of relativism and, and nihilism that you sort of talk about a little bit in your book? And what I see your work as kind of providing is, and this is again some word, wording that you use, the ethical guideposts, if you will, for transformative action. And so the way I see these case studies is that they offer us, in a sense, um, kind of a moral uh, compass as to understanding what are some of these consequences that are really worthwhile having. Um, you know, in, in, in looking at, at some of these uh, case studies, um, Again, you know, you, you kind of talked a little bit about the, the three main ways in which you conceive of the import of pragmatist philosophy for urbanism, uh, the concept of the city as flux, um, the question of, of consequences and accidental consequences perhaps, um, and the political aspects of, of urbanism, which is an important one. Um, I, I kind of wondered, and this is kind of where I'll, I'll start kind of introducing, weaving that question, that provocative question I have into, into this discussion. Um, I kind of wondered whether, um, and, and definitely that's also the case, whether these case studies that you present, uh, the ones you presented today and the ones that you have in the book, kind of speak to more tangible concepts as well. Um, the, the case study that we saw on the Azhar Park, for example, in Cairo, um, you know, in a more tangible way, you kind of can read this as an example of the relationship between urban design and economic development, or the economic development kind of consequence of an, of an urban design um, uh, project. And, and so the question is, in, in, in my mind, um, and again thinking about the, the entire pragmatist philosophy about having ideas that do have consequences, and this is where the you know, provocation I suppose is, um, you know, at, at what level of abstraction uh, would a theory still have you know, kind of useful and important consequences? Um, so, so we talked a little bit about flux, about unintended consequences, about political import, and I'm sort of wondering how is it that we can compare these sets of ideas to maybe more tangible and typical ways in which we think about urban design and urbanism, um, you know, theories about economic development, um, about community building, um, and, and maybe one where what you presented and, and what I'm suggesting here kind of overlap, which is this notion of political empowerment. Um, so there are these sets of more abstract thoughts and then kind of more practical, tangible ways in which, in which we think about um, urbanism. And maybe if I, if I spend a few minutes to say a few words about you know, one of these kind of theoretical frames, which I've spent some time looking at in my own work, which is this idea of, of community building, um, maybe more of a humanist, impact of, of urban design that um, I didn't, I don't think I saw you maybe cover in, in some of the case studies that you had in the book and 
you know, I would think that in, in any future editions that would maybe be a kind of welcome addition to, to that set of ideas. Um, so, and in here I'm sort of talking about this idea of the, the way urban design can, can help communities sort of understand themselves in terms of their identity. And so this is sort of the concept of the spatial construction of identity. Um, I'll, I'll just, you know, briefly go three, go through three maybe, um, um, three projects that I'm sort of uh, familiar with um, here in, 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 in not, not too far away. Uh, there's been kind of a long-standing uh, dispute over the construction or the extension of a freeway, the 710 freeway, uh, connecting to the 210 freeway and that passes through a community, South Pasadena, that for a long period of time has been kind of in the way of that project and resisting it in various ways. Um, but, you know, it's, it was, it's, this is kind of an interesting story of how this, this small community kind of, because of the threat of, of that project, kind of uh, went through various legislative maneuvers and, and kind of understood itself through its construction of its spatial identity um, as a small historic town with historic resources. Um, and, and, and so they, you know, they developed this sense of, of self out of, um, out of understanding um, the threats to their, you know, to their, to their urbanism, let's say, in this sense. Um, close to where I teach um, in, in Pomona, uh, the city has been for the last, you know, last few years going through this process of reimagining its, uh, its downtown. Um, for the longest period of time, they kind of thought of themselves kind of a, a more of a regional node and, you know, the, the, the way they've marketed themselves was something like Metro, uh, Metro Pomona. Um, and it's, they're sort of kind of zooming into a more kind of uh, um, local definition. The, the, new, the new moniker is something like downtown Pomona. This is kind of a visioning process that they've been going through. Not necessarily a lot of uh, kind of, you know, tangible um, you know, urban design interventions yet. But the visioning process itself has kind of allowed the community to understand itself as kind of some, you know, a community that's maybe more urban, more progressive than, than maybe what it was, um, you know, 10 or 20 years back. Maybe I'll just stick to these two examples, but again, this is kind of maybe one thing I would have liked to, to kind of see complement some of the thinking in, in, your prod, in, in the case studies that you've presented. Um, and, <clears throat> and maybe again, feeding this, this question, which, which I sort of introduced a few minutes earlier, as to maybe what is it, how is it that we can think of, of these ideas, you know, community building, economic <laughs> development, political empowerment, in relation to some of these ideas that you presented, like flux and, and the concept of unintended consequences and so on. But in, but in all in all, I think it's, you know, a, a great uh, addition to, to the scholarship and, uh, you know, perhaps one day we'll teach it as we do teach Jane Jacobs, so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Well, first of all, Congratulations, Haseem, on an excellent book. Uh, <clears throat> the dilemma for me is I know this book uh, quite intimately. Uh, we've had hundreds of conversations about this over the years. Uh, so the subjects that he talks about are very familiar, and I largely uh, agree with many of the ideas. In fact, many of our conversations have shaped my own thinking of urbanism in so many ways and expanded my boundaries of what it means. Uh, but a couple of thoughts that came to mind. Uh, Asim asked me to write a, a phrase for the, the back cover of the book. And uh, I, I, it was an interesting opportunity but just to summarize succinctly what I thought about it. And I'm going to use that as a spring point to a, a few points and then a question for Asim. Uh, and I said something along the lines of, you know, there are many books out there that, uh, that claim to, uh, <coughs> to capture the symbiosis of theory and praxis. Uh, but I think there are very few that actually actually do it successfully. And I think this is one of them. And I'm going to talk about what I, what I think about that. Uh, but as, uh, as I heard him speak today, and as I've read the book many times now, the, the, the thought that occurs to me is this is a highly reactionary book. I mean, this, this is almost like a, a jolt of a reaction from a person, almost to the point of uh, sometimes sounding very skeptical. And uh, I like it because uh, this kind of skepticism is, is very healthy and very good, particularly from an extremely informed individual. But I would encourage you to particularly read the, the introduction, the first chapter, What Can Urbanism Be? Because I was telling Tridib a few days ago that 
this man hasn't spared anybody. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, you, you basically take every single idea, major position on urbanism, uh, you do your best to really digest it, understand it, but then react to it, critique it. Uh, and, and why I'm saying this, this word reaction is because reactions are the beginnings of things that take a long time to come to fruition. Uh, any, any kind of reaction is not something that will tangibly create an understanding of what we're saying easily. It occurred to me because when I first read this book in November, I think it was, or December, over Christmas, there was another book that had come out at the same time called uh, Happy City, which many of you might have heard of. It's by an award-winning Canadian journalist, Charles Montgomery. And uh, it was a very wonderful book. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, and I think it's a very necessary book as much as this one. And the, and, uh, and the dichotomy for me is very interesting because the pitch in Happy City was about again, written for a lay person, <coughs> which is far more difficult to write, I would argue, than an academic book. And the basic pitch was by taking you on an excursion on how cities uh, like, scary cities like Bogota, for example, were uh, transformed into happy cities in his de definition, uh, a rather one-dimensional definition compared to what we've heard here, which is making it more pedestrian friendly, making it walkable, and so on and so forth, nonetheless very important concepts, uh, really going through Vancouver and all these cities, basically made the point that the changing of a city is ultimately a project about human happiness. And I found that an extremely refreshing insight uh, about the larger issues of what, what uh, urbanism means in its own way. When, when Montgomery spoke with the mayor of Bogota, he said, we knew right from the beginning that it was useless for us to go on changing our cities to compete with the United States and all the reformist planning that's happening in the United States. We don't have the money and neither would we be able to have the consequences towards it in the long term. So what he decided to do was, as we all know, he banned all the major projects and focused on Ciclovia and all these other things way back in 1972 and the results of it over 30, 40 years. And now that Bogota is now winning all kinds of awards for progressive planning. But the point is, here's the point I want to make. When you read a book like Happy City, it brings hope. And I think that's a very important thing. And I want to say this because this book is not about hope. This is about very deep reflection. And, and the point is we need both. And, and, and this is what I want to put forth because I know there are a lot of students sitting here and is a very impressive speaker, very brilliant thinker. But I think we should not be under the impression, and neither does he mean it, uh, that, that we should only be reactionaries to everything. So we, we need messages of hope. It's like a sprint. Uh, you know, you need to get from here to there. It's a 100-yard dash. You need to go there and you win. I think this book is a marathon. This, this book cannot be read over a coffee. I, I myself read it three, four times, and I'm going to return to it many, many times to think more of the questions. This book doesn't provide answers like the happy city of how problems were solved. Uh, case studies presented were not so much about answers, they were about questions. Questions are very difficult to understand and they take a hell of a lot of time. So uh, my point is that there is a whole genre of books out there like this, a few I would argue, that we need to accept as, as marathon uh, books that we will return to again and again. I hope I see yourself will, as, through True Lab and others build on this and, and, and continue the search. The second thing is, I want to talk a little bit from the point of view of being a mainstream urban design practitioner. Uh, and again, I know Asim's work, we work together on many projects, so I know what he means. But from the presentation I saw today, uh, I want to just put forth a sort of a, a, a point out there, which is not to lose faith in the physical city. He doesn't mean that. I know, I know he has, loves physical cities, in fact. But if you, if you think about the projects that were shown and the emphasis on uh, the non-physical aspect of the city, the process-driven aspect of the city, uh, <clears throat> I think it can create a misunderstanding, particularly in a, in a normal audience, uh, and, and this is largely the agenda of, of, for, for planning, that the physical city uh, is superficial. Uh, that's not what he means. But it is important to understand that the making of the physical city is extremely important. Because ultimately, all these projects are physical. 
uh, and, and particularly in the United States, uh, th there's a whole genre of city making that happens through simple physical design. Question he's asking, and this is the takeaway for me as a mainstream practitioner, is perhaps we need to do a far better job in not just being far more reflective about our physical designs, but far more reflective about how we communicate our physical designs. Because that's, 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 the, that's the message I got out of it. I mean, it, it, it's about how do we communicate that we as, as mainstream practitioners do not have the luxury of thinking as deeply as Asim or others who have the forums to think about it. When we're jumping like butterflies from plant to plant, from project to project, very limited circumstances, I think the plea I'm hearing here is to not just be reactive and reflective, but also to, to communicate these ideas much more carefully so that the people who are the real stakeholders, who are going to have the consequences, uh, will understand it differently than lose faith in the physical city. And the last thing I want to say is, this is, leads to my question, you know, there's a geopolitical shift going on. Many of us are chasing a lot of work outside the country, uh, abroad. Uh, and, and I found this book extremely insightful because it really presented a panoramic set of projects that uh, convincingly talked about the pluralism of urbanism uh, because the circumstances of cultures and places are very different. And so my question now to leave, uh, sort of put it on the seam is, one of my favorite parts of this book is the last part where you end. And you bring two very important figures into the picture. You bring Gandhi and you bring Martin Luther King. And uh, you can read the book, but and it makes this beautiful analogy of how these two figures were brilliantly strategic in creating change in their own social forums by situating themselves in a very empathetic way into the pressure points of the people and the circumstances that they read. Gandhi did not, was not able to chart the influence he had in the freedom struggle of India unless he knew exactly what pressure points to touch, and Martin Luther King the same. So my question to you is, you, you leave us on this you know, very profound message of trying to find ways of being empathetic towards cities, of trying to talk to cities in their own terms, and so on and so forth. But I wonder if you could talk to us more about it, expand and give us some more insights as you brought all these projects together. Did you, did you, did you get some deeper realizations on what exactly that means? I mean how do you, what, what does it mean for all of us as different actors shaping the city to understand cities on their own terms? So I wonder, I hope I can hear from you on that. Time is really important. I mean I call the city the four dimensional object. So there's the three dimensions and the dimension of time. And that's where sort of the city as flux comes in, is how do we understand, manage, embrace, and use time uh, and go beyond just you know, the end result and end product. And so for, for example, one of the things uh, I argue for that we should have much more radical imaginaries. I think one of the problems is we are too, we are not imaginative enough but to have grand visions and radical shifts and how we can fundamentally improve cities, we do need incremental steps, which might be small projects, which might be, so like, you know, even the, some of the work I've done, you know, this is, again, you know, part of human nature is uh, you can have all the conversations and dialogues you want in community participation, but human nature is they want to see something. They want to see some tangible sign that something is happening. So how do you cultivate that kind of long-term vision, but through short-term incremental project steps that leads to that larger? And that was what so, uh, I didn't talk about Gandhi and King, because that's a whole different thing, but that was so brilliant about Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King. They had these huge visions. I mean, I mean just let me take Mahatma Gandhi, amazing. One of the most powerful colonial empires in the world was thrown off without violence. People talk about the American Revolution, violent. Russian Revolution, violent. French Revolution, violent. What's happening now, violent. It was, can you imagine that? I mean, but it wasn't just like, oh, let's just keep talking about nonviolence. It was like, how do you tie it into concrete, specific things that people care about, right? So it's this 
breathtaking vision that takes decades. That's the other thing, the time factor you were talking about. In cities, you can't talk for about less than decades. So if you want to be a really effective urbanist, you better understand, you better be patient. That if you want, again, fundamental change, not just a few nice cute things here and there. Uh, but what do you do in the meanwhile as you build towards that? You do specific concrete things that people can relate to and people benefit from, whether it's you know, small projects in the city, affordable housing, public space. But it has to be part of a larger vision. It can't be just like, oh, here's another affordable housing product. Here's another TOD. Here's another park. Here's a, what is it building towards? You gave the example of the big dig and talked a little bit about high-speed rail and these projects which are at their core infrastructure transportation improvements have all these wonderful opportunities for benefit, but that benefit is often out of scope or it could be an additional work beyond the core function of the project, therefore not in the funding plan and the state or the country's um, initiative that got the project on the page in the first place. So how do, you, how do you address that need from more of a practical standpoint? Is that something where you need to work with the communities and other ancillary project partners to sort of almost do like add-on projects to the big project? Um, or do you need to set it up in a phasing standpoint so you can get the big work done and then follow up with the smaller projects? Because it seems like if you try to get it all done from the get-go, you might overwhelm and then misdirect the original core project itself. Yeah, that's a really good question. So one implicit underlying uh, sort of message of the book is we accept the current system as given. We are too accepting of the current system that, oh, this is legislation, you have to jump through these hoops. So there are a couple of ways of doing that. Of course, the ideal way is to invent new systems, which takes a long time. But if you think about it, even this system was invented. How the high-speed rail is being approved or not approved, somebody over the years and decades invented that system of approving, not approving it. I think we should work for those bigger ones. But in the meanwhile, one of the things is how do you work within the system in kind of very creative ways, laterally, sideways, upside down, backwards, etc. Uh, and I think one of the ways of being an effective urbanist and practitioner is to be nimble, not to get so caught up in constraints and things as given. Oh, this is, oh, I must now do step one. Oh, and I must do step two, because this is what we learned in legislative class, uh, is kind of saying, where's the wiggle room? Where can I push and pull? Where can I kind of subvert the process? Where can I create <coughs> openings which weren't there? So uh, like the high speed rail, yes, it might be afterwards. I mean, it's such a battle just getting it built that if you pile on more, uh, it might be. So again, that's sort of urbanism as a creative political act. Like politically, what might work? And you take one step back, but then you kind of come through some, maybe you work with communities, maybe you finding, uh, find funding some other ways. Uh, because, and you have to constantly do that. I think you have to constantly create, find and create this wiggle room for creativity and kind of subversive practice. Because otherwise, one of the implicit problems in, is that we wait implicitly like, oh, we have to have the perfect governor and the perfect state legislature and the perfect community and then we can do the perfect project. Never going to happen. So given the messy, complicated reality, how do you create that? And I think that's a big part of creativity. Can I add something to that? I, I would also say it, it, it comes down also to good planning and to, um, to really looking into the consequences of what projects might, you know, might bring about that may not be necessarily only the particular scope that might be narrow. So let's find another, I mean, Tridim and I some years ago looked into the blue line. And this was a line that was built with cities doing absolutely no planning around the, the station areas. The result was that 10 years later, when we were looking uh, and evaluating what has happened, there was very little around. And in the end, something that might appear as kind of too expensive to do, uh, planning, additional planning in order to do that, it becomes such a lost opportunity that the project becomes you know, wasteful if you don't do it. And I think I see this happening to a certain extent with the high-speed rail, where cities are quite unprepared. Uh, and with, you know, I, I don't know how you know the big dig better, uh, how these spaces appeared, have they pre-planned for them? But I think the, the whole essence of planning is to really predict what are some of these consequences and plan for them. Something that I've seen in work I've done is that it can be very difficult to convince a city or a community to invest in a project or use tax money to invest 
in a project that really is benefiting people 15 years down the line. And I was wondering if you think that partially stems from the fact that we treat everything as a project base, not a vision base, or maybe how, you know, in a practical way, you can help engage residents about the long-term effects of things. I, you know, I think politically, so many projects stall because of that. And I was wondering if you have some practical suggestions for how to get people engaged with the future. I'm glad you use that word. Every time I hear the word practical, it makes me cringe. <laughs> and I, I know you didn't mean it that way, but practicality is an excuse for mediocrity. It's like, oh, we've got to get it done. What's practical? Let's take the lowest common denominator. Let's, this is what's needed, right? Uh, and I totally agree with you. That, that is a kind of huge pressure on practitioners. Like, great, these ideas, this airy-fairy stuff is great, but how do we do it in this thing? And I think uh, there's kind of, again, the larger vision is we have to move towards that. And the more we say practical and short-term thinking, we compromise, compromise, compromise. And we have these wonderful, uh, incredibly mediocre projects all over the world where the only people who think it's wonderful are the designers and the people who give them awards. Like, oh, this is amazing. And you look at it like, no, it's a piece of crap. Uh, but it was practical. And so there's this, I think we have to, this is, a, again, a lifetime uh, mission is to keep pushing towards what is practical and redefining what is practical, is looking at the future and helping people see these things in different ways. In the short term, uh, I agree, I mean, the, the constraints are overwhelming, but there are, you know, the examples in the book, there are many other examples of how, how people have overcome those constraints. How, so for example, uh, some of you might have read this book by Norm Crumholz, Making Equity Planning Work, and how in the 70s, uh, in Cleveland, they did affordable housing in the face of huge opposition, and how they brought in, mobilized senior citizens. But if they had just said, well, the city, the mayor, the council, and he was in hot water because the mayor was against it and the council, they bust in seniors at these meetings. And that's a great point because what happens in these projects is usually the opposition is there and vocal and up there. The supporters are kind of doing their own thing and there may be one or two show up. So that's an example of how do you not see the constraints as given but you slap them back. And yeah, sometimes it's not this kind of, you know, the notion of moral choice. It's not just, well, this is my job. I'm getting paid, so I must be a robot. It's saying, you know, even in this job, and the tough part is how do you do your job without losing it, but you're smart about it and you kind of, again, sort of do things in a very, maybe not illegal, but borderline illegal. <laughs> Ethical, but borderline illegal. The very subversive uh, view of subversive planning, right? <laughs> yeah. Subversive urbanism. Yeah, this, this morning I was giving two examples of a project that I worked on nearby. Uh, and since it's being videotaped, I won't say which, where it is. Uh, but it was, uh, let's just say it's not, it's in the Los Angeles metropolitan region. And they were heavily against affordable housing. Heavily. It was, again, a, a big chunk of the population is Latino, but of course the power structure is white and male, of course. And so, uh, and affordable housing is a problem everywhere. I mean, Los Angeles is very expensive. And how can you not have affordable housing? So they would not put it on, it was not an agenda, any agenda, anything. I just kept putting it in, putting it on the agenda. And the planning commission would meet, the city council would meet, and it was like, agenda item four, affordable housing. <laughs> Sam, did you put that on there, Joe? No, but okay, so what's going on? And they were like, nah, and they would kind of forget it. And then it would come back again, and they were like, how did this come back? And I would be like, I don't, know. I don't know. Anyway, long story short, just kept coming back, and now so that city now has an official affordable housing policy. Uh, a second example in the same city was, uh, so uh, we were uh, recruited by the city, and then they opposed everything we did. It was a very bizarre thing. So we were recruited, and, but they stymied everything we did. And I was like, what's going on? So even though like, the mayor and city council are supposed, supposed to represent the community, they were not. And one of the reasons was the community was not showing up at these public hearings and voicing their opinions. And so I would make calls and say, you, you need to come to the community meeting again and again. I didn't quite work, but I tried. They showed up, and they, it was really funny. And, and, and you know, life is funny. 
and they would show up and they were like, oh, we want to thank the mayor and the city council. You're doing a wonderful job. And no, you're not supposed to say that. <laughs> you're supposed to say you work for us. <laughs> and why are you making these decisions? But you know, that's only so much I can do. But so there are, I mean, examples where, again, you know, borderline, you know, I didn't want us to lose the job. But, and these are minor examples. They're examples of much kind of, uh, much more subversive ways of doing things. Everything you, you've described, everything you, you, you're describing, can be construed as what our friends, uh, tactical urbanists, call basically tactics. I mean, what was just described here is a kind of a tactic, which in a way is a, a, a very clever uh, reading that the system, as it should work, is not working. And therefore, you're reacting to it in a very stealthy way. And yet, I have heard you both in the book and in our conversations being very skeptical and almost, you know, of very tactical, of tactical urbanists. Yeah, I am. So, please. Yeah, so I mean, w the way I would answer that is, and I think this might be a good way to end this discussion, is uh, from my research, I travel a lot, I uh, do a lot of work. We just did a project in Brazil. We do a lot of work in New York, uh, everywhere. The most cutting edge ideas and the most exciting work in urbanism is being done by non-profits. And not just nonprofits, but nonprofits which are activist and advocacy organizations. You know why? Because they don't take the system as given. They don't just say, this is the rules, we have to do this, we have to do that. They are actually operating outside, they are operating within the system. They get funding from cities and foundations, but they do things outside and they pay the price. They are small organizations, they struggle for funding. But the best ideas, and they don't call themselves planners or urban designers, they call them, they're interested in social justice, environmental justice, open space, transportation, <laughs> pedestrians, street vendors. And every city, I know Los Angeles has it, New York has it, has these amazing, sometimes really small, <coughs> fantastic organizations. And I think the reason they can be so incredibly cutting edge, and I think we need to work with them, support them, enhance them, is because they don't take the system as given and they realize in the end what has to change is the system. And in their own small ways, it's incredible. I mean, I admire their courage. You know some of these nonprofits, they barely make money, they're barely surviving. They have way more courage than most people. And I think because they have these beliefs and ideas and they work towards them. Like I worked with them in Detroit. Sometimes it takes them 20, 30 years. Like the bike lanes and the bike share, bike share system in New York is the result of one of the organizations called Transportation Alternatives, who has been working on this for 40 years. Talk about guts. You know, it's not about easy, short-term answers, but it's this systemic changes.